How you doing, everyone? Sorry, I'm going to apologize, first of all, for my voice. And it's not from being out too late last night. I promise. Um, I wish it was. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about, we've got a couple people that are going to come up and talk um, from HBO and from Facebook. And it's a pretty cool topic, and I think all of us here in the television industry um, have certainly had conversations about it in regard to linear versus digital and where we're driving platforms, uh, where people, where we're gathering audiences and who we're talking to and how we're talking to them, talking about big data and everything that you've heard over the last couple of days. Um, so it's really interesting to take their perspective and their point of view when we talk about Facebook and we talk about HBO. Um, you know, I'm at Warner Brothers and we have a lot of network shows um, and we're also across platform and numerous platforms. And so for us to listen to these guys talk about what their strategy is and how they're building audiences and where they're gathering audiences and how they're driving people in both platforms, multiple platforms, linear and digital, um, it's interesting to hear them talk about. So today they're going to come up, they're going to talk about a um, little fireside chat. There's a Q&A at the end uh, for everyone to be able to ask questions. God, I sound like shit, don't I? <laughs> I was going to make a joke earlier about Larry David, and I was going to talk about Orange is the New Black, and we never really got to that point where we were bonding, so I didn't feel like I could bring that up, but interesting news for the day. Um, anyway, so from, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to read off a piece of paper so I don't screw up the names. Um, Senior Vice President of Digital Media and Marketing from HBO, Sabrina Calori. <laughs> and Head of Industry, U.S. Entertainment, Global Sales from Facebook, Gwen Throckmorton. Thank you. I didn't know we didn't bond. I Apparently we didn't bond. Day. Okay. Well, <laughs> next time. Good morning. Is it afternoon? It's afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank yeah, you. We're standing Packed room, room only. only. We better not disappoint. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, we are so happy to be here to talk about going off the grid. I say the grid. We debated if there should be a the in there. And, and what the future of TV marketing holds. We have um, built a really great partnership. Um, between our two companies, and we're just really excited to extract all the goodness of Sabrina's brain and all that her team has done uh, in the next few minutes. She agreed to let me have a few minutes just to set some context as to what we see as we work with entertainment marketers across the board, and specifically how that applies to TV. So I think she, um, we took over-unders on how many times I say the word mobile, but we'll go ahead and get started, right? So when you think about it, Right? The reason that we're here and the reason that we are certainly thinking about all this change is mobile has changed us. It's changed audiences, and with that, it's changed our business. And really, a lot of people talk about it like it's the age of disruption, as if that's a bad thing. But at the other, age, uh, the other end of the spectrum is innovation. And innovation is doing the same things but finding ways to improve on them. And when that happens, it progresses into um, new opportunities and it forces you to be different which then causes change that leads to disruption and disruption helps you basically create new opportunities that then make the old things obsolete most often times and as we think about that oh, I went backwards my apologies no it's not moving there we go I think about the definition of insanity, right, which is doing the same thing and expecting different results. One of the things that we struggle with, and certainly Sabrina and her team have break this, broken this mold, is doing the same thing and expecting the same results. And that's where a lot of people get stuck. And so as we think about why we're here today, what you guys have been talking about at what's traditionally been a TV promotions and marketing conference is you know, three things to consider as you face this, the, all these changes in the marketplace. And although I, I look very youthful, I have about a little more than 15 years experience of having done these things and worked with a variety of businesses. And so hopefully these will be helpful for you, certainly as we dig in and, and provide uh, insight into HBO's strategy. The first thing is we have a 32-hour day going on, right? So when you think about it, attention has become our scarcest resource. So from the age of t beginning of time to 2003, um, there was five billion gigabytes of information created. Now, that gets created every 10 minutes. So by the time we're done today, 15 billion gigabytes of information will be created. That's pretty insane, right? Mind blown, think about that. When you then add the fact that our time, 
right? I'm not dealing with my animation very well. When you then add that there's no more hours in the day, it's basically creating a squeeze. And this squeeze is, is, is tough for most marketers, but it's very opportunistic for TV uh, marketers. And let me tell you why. So when you think about it, you've got work and sleep and all the things that we do in their day leading to about 20 hours. But we still want to consume content. In fact, we're consuming more than 11 hours of content. And if you do the math, that's not really adding up, right? So we're getting to a 32-hour day. We're finding ways to be uber consumers of content and to multitask. The opportunity as for TV marketers, no matter where they are, is to make sure that we're doing that in a way that actually can break through. And so, so what you're saying is give people I knew you were better, me. better yeah. stuff to watch when they're bored at work. Pretty much. That's what, <laughs> that's what God made Facebook for, right? So or or be, convince yeah. people to be insomniacs Pretty to much. watch your shows. Pretty much. Well, you know what that's like, right? <laughs> yes. And that's what we will aim for. So really, when you think about this squeeze, the great opportunity for us is content um, providers, and certainly for, for networks like HBO, is there's tons of content and tons of choices, but there's still the opportunity that people want to watch television. In fact, compared to 10 years ago, people are assume, uh, consuming an hour more of TV each day. And so with that, there's, you know, despite having 900 channels, people on average are still focusing on around 17 channels or programs. So that just shows you how, when you combine the time that is in the day and what I need to do with that time and shove into that time with all the choices that I have, differentiating yourself, building loyalty, thinking about how you break through is key. And then you add on that the fact that there's so many different devices that people can consume TV content. In fact, I think it's 60% that are on more than two devices a day and one in four people are on more than three. That's a, that's a and that's on top of the TV set, right? So. Tremendous opportunity just to think about what a multi-platform world looks like and how you reach consumers. And so with that, that complexity becomes a navigation exercise. So how do you find these audiences across these platforms and continue to engage them in ways that matter? This one Sabrina and I laughed about, and she gave me a little bit of hell out there. <laughs> it's not dead. Here's what it is. It's changed. The marketing funnel has changed, right? Tr applying traditional linear models to your marketing strategies is not in reality in line with the way people are consuming. And so when you think about it, um, using a nonlinear strategy requires a sequential, um, a nonlinear sequential storytelling strategy. And that's why we're here talking with HBO today, because if anyone has gotten it, it's them. Non-sequential, non-sequential, nonlinear storytelling is a blend of art and science. It's embracing digital to augment traditional ways of doing things, which means that we go and we use the new levers of targeting and optimization and optimizing TV creative for a mobile world to get the right audiences on the right screens at the right time. And so with that, did I go too long? You'll give me trouble later. Oh, no, she'll tell me. She told me Twitter would tell me later, which is a lovely thing to say to a Facebook person. <laughs> but that's OK. So in the face of all this change, I just teed up. Like, HBO has been able to break out of the mold, right? And truly exist where viewers are across platforms. How has your approach to marketing evolved to match these viewing habits? Well, I think when we were talking about the tee-up slides, when I saw the tee-up slides, um, I felt like they... they <laughs> you say that with such love. I know. Um, but, but they're really true. I mean, th this is, and for all the TV marketers in this room, like th this is the shit that keeps us up at night, right? Like, not only is there, are there so many platforms and so much competition even outside of TV viewing, right, for, for media and for people's attention these days, um, the, the actual landscape of the quality uh, for all of you who are creating content out there, the quality has just really risen. Um, and I think those are the things that really have driven us to have to think differently. Um, so I think one of the, there's a few key things that, ha that you've started to see in changes in our strategy this year, which will continue. Um, one is flighting. Camp and traditional linear, like this isn't about driving, we're not even talking about driving OTT viewership right now. Just when we're talking about driving to a linear premiere, yes, that first viewing, that first premiere is still very important, but so, is those, so are those first two months. We know that people continue to discover stuff once it's out. Right? And that was a big shift for us, that we actually need to spend money after the premiere. Um, and figuring out how much, how long, what is that, how do you, we always use this probably poor expression of, you know, if you get 
if you get natural word of mouth, you need to have money left over to pour gasoline on that word of mouth to make sure that we're really um, trying to hit that show into the zeitgeist, because all the advertising in the world can't do what natural word of mouth does, right? But they can work hand in hand and, and make it better. Um, the other is sampling. So in a world where there's so much competition for, for time, um, and, and there's really, really great content out there. Like, let's be honest, we're not the only player in this business anymore. You really need to get people, you need to let people see and touch and, and watch the product. And for us, you know, when we're, everything's behind a paywall, that was a, a really big shift, that we need to give stuff out for free. We need to let people actually experience it and, and make that a core part of our strategy um, going going forward, um, yeah, cool. Wait, I'm just curious. When you um, started to sample, did you see a, a specific audience start to engage that maybe you hadn't had before in terms of specific demographic? Or it kind of depends on the show, and I think you know the, the sampling approaches are different. So. Um, since it's Facebook, uh, we very successfully sampled the, the premiere episode of Ballers on Facebook, right? So we let uh, The Rock, who has a massive Facebook um, presence and audience, we let him give that whole out. And, and that was very specific because we wanted to reach his audience, which is, it can kind of be different than the core HBO audience. Mm -hmm. and, and in that case, you know, I think we were, we did see a slightly younger, a slightly more multicultural audience engaging with the content than I think we would have of if, um, if we wouldn't have put it out on So the slight platform. discomfort of actually teasing that netted out and so many opportunities that it was worth letting Definitely. it go. Definitely. Yeah. So when you think about, you mentioned streaming versus linear. Yep. Um, what have you found to be the key differences of marketing on each of those? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the launch of HBO now is, was a tremendous shift for us. And, and as we think about, and we've, we've learned so much in the last... I guess it's been 14 months since that product has been live, um, about what it means to do direct-to-consumer marketing. Like when, for us, we were technically a wholesaler prior to this. Um, and so that has really, I think we've, we've had to take a lot of cues from, from true D2C marketers. And I think the first is, um, it's performance driven. So, you know, in a world, and I'm sure we'll get in and talk about metrics, but, um, you know, as we talk about the traditional linear business where we know that, that buzz and rate, you know, buzz and ratings are sort of your key drivers, in this world, we're talking about, you know, cost per subscriber and lifetime value and really measuring the effectiveness of our dollars, which as a marketer is, a, is an entirely different level of scrutiny on every dollar you spend um, and how effective that is. Um, the other is, you know, it takes um, the, the, the ongoing investment and engagement um, in a streaming service is really key. So we had to build an entire retention team, right, an entire practice around true CRM and thinking about how we keep that person engaged every single month so that they're willing to take that wallet out every single month and continue to play. The churn is a lot higher on a, on a streaming platform than it is on a linear business, partly because you don't have to go and call your cable operator to cancel. It, we make it by nature, it's, it's much easier to cancel. And so that means it takes a lot more work on our side to think about how do we keep people um, engaged and watching and opening an app every single day. And I think that's really the third that's been crazy for us and to go back to your mobile slides and why I think we've been working so closely with, with partners like Facebook is that um, we're essentially driving app downloads and app engagement. And so when you think about the fact that the transaction is happening on this smaller screen and the kind of ad units and ad creative and kind of canvas that you have is very different than if, you, if we weren't in that world. So those have been kind of key drivers that have, have really um, affected the way we think. So you talked a lot about having to kind of reset and, and build completely new processes and whatnot. So tell me from an organizational standpoint, what kind of change was necessary to be able to do these things? And it's certainly as you manage teams and, and whatnot. Yeah, um, so, so I, I like to talk about it um, as people, process, and technology, right? So 
those three things we had to fundamentally kind of re-examine. Uh, the first is, you know, we, we the, the people that we were working with, both our, our internal teams and our agencies. So, so we went through a, um, an agency change on the now business where we needed to move towards an agency that was reared on performance-driven advertising. It's a completely different mindset um, and skill set and capability and also requires um, a much bigger team to manage the ongoing, always on optimizations that you get when you have, when you literally have a performance driven, always on strategy versus a, you know, uh, a 12 week burst and crescendo strategy, which is a, which was the old kind of way of doing things on the linear side. Um, and then internally, we had to get, you know, true data driven marketers. Into our, into our business and into our marketing teams. Um, we had to invest in data scientists and real partnerships with our research team. And then we really had to think about things like the MarTech stack, right? So traditional linear TV advertisers, you don't need a really robust marketing technology stack um, behind that. When you start to do the type of analysis that we need to do, when you're starting to connect things like this is why I think the funnel's not totally dead. Um, you know, the, the acquisition to retention efforts, when you're really trying to look at the way that you pass consumers um, through all of your efforts and try and connect that, the, the kind of fragment, the new fragmented funnel, it takes, it takes a real understanding of the technology infrastructure that is needed to support that. I'm just curious, hearing you talk about that, how much of that did you decide, I know you kind of made mention, but how much of that did you decide to keep in-house versus yeah. rely on partners? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, and what considerations were you thinking about as you did that, especially sure. at the speed you guys were moving, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I am, for better or for worse, always in favor of building resources internally. Um, that, you know, my... my history at HBO, I started the social practice there, and I think part of what was so different about us so early on is that we made a, a real kind of, we, we put a stake in the ground way earlier than I think a lot of our competitors did and said, I'm not outsourcing this. This is a capability that we need in order to be successful in our future. Um, otherwise, you know, we're just gonna continue to pay interns at agencies to do stuff that it doesn't have, that has real brand kind of value for us. So, so it's been a mix because we also live in a world and, and everyone is here where we have tight budgets and we have restrictions on headcount. And so we've really had to think about where is this about training the staff that we have um, to be more adept in these skill sets and how can you invest in your people um, and give them the tools that they need to be more successful in their careers long term as well as with us at HBO. So the kind of data and analysis piece is really key and something we've spent a lot of time working with our existing teams. And then how do we um, put some key strategic hires in core roles that will help lead, you know, the kind of division. So we had to hire from outside somebody to lead a retention practice. We, that's not something we had um, before. Awesome. So you, you mentioned um, this balance, right? And, and, I, and I think about HBO, you guys have clearly been a market leader when it comes to content and, and your brand. Obviously, a lot of choices in front of you and your team each day. Yeah. How do you balance and where do you prioritize being first or yes. being best? Um, that's such an interesting question. You can't have both. I know. You know, look, I, I, think, I think that, um, again, sort of going back to my, my original role in social, um, I think there's a tendency for marketers to chase the next shiny object. Um, and that has never been HBO's um, kind of brand DNA. I think we are, like everyone, it's really nice to be first and to get that headline and to get that shine. but not if it means sacrificing what we're good at. And for us, what we always try and say, and the kind of, the, the, the kind of checklist we've given the team as they think about these opportunities is, um, are, we, are we doing this in a way that is core to our brand meaning? Is it premium? Is it high quality? Are we telling a good story? Those are all key to like, who we are, um, and if we're doing that and we happen to be first, that's great. Um, I think a, a great example for us of something that, that is um, 
near and dear to this relationship, it, um, the opening credits for Game of Thrones, right? We were able to do that in 360 in partnership with Facebook, um, and it has become the most successful 360 video on Facebook's platform to date. Uh, we weren't the first one by any but, means. I mean, you broke all records. Video. It was, what, I believe, over 12 million views in 24 hours. It was. It was pretty amazing. But that was the right way to do it for yeah. HBO. We sort of waited for the right moment for the story that, that was the right one for us to tell and for something that we felt like would still be a high quality experience, not just sort of sending somebody off to set with a 360 rig and hoping we get something good and posting it and seeing what happens. Like that, that's, not been our, um, that's not been our strategy to right. date. So you mentioned a little bit earlier about having to have new metrics yeah. um, as you've evolved your strategy. What are you looking at for, to determine success? Yeah, uh, that's, that's great. And actually, I had forgotten I have some creative. And given that this is yeah, Pro yeah. Max, I thought it might be a good idea to show a little bit of creative. But this is probably a good, a good way to talk about some of this. Um, the metrics really had changed. And it goes back to this, like, is the funnel dead or not dead? I think one of the things that we had to learn, right, as we thought about D2C is you at, we actually need to do the work all across every element of the funnel. So. Um, HBO Now is a new product. We had to build awareness and we had to, um, we had to explain the core value proposition to this audience that didn't actually have a whole lot of exposure to HBO, which was totally new and kind of, we had to check our arrogance in thinking that like, of course everyone knows um, who HBO is and what our content is. That's not true, particularly as you get to a younger demographic. So, um, video is very key to us, and in that case, we are looking at traditional awareness metrics. How do you build reach? How are you getting you know, cost per completed view, things like that, things that are more on the typical side. So this is, a, um, this is an acquisition spot we did. So, so in something like this, you know, we, it, it really is about creating reach and then creating audience pools that can be used later on for, for more, in this particular case, um, for mobile app install ads, right? Where we know that we've kind of done the work of exposing you to the product, for, to the value proposition, to some of the, um, you know, some of the programs that we're pushing. And then when we get, you know, the kind of much smaller canvas, uh, we can kind of do that very DR heavy work with the start your free trial message. Um, so he here's an example of an app install ad where you can see the canvas is so much smaller and you know, we've, we've really had to kind of move, move to a much kind of tighter call to action and kind of get a lot of the, the, the more traditional um, kind of uh, the, the um, kind of fluffy marketing language out of there and just go, hey, you can start for, for one month free. Um, this, I threw this in uh, just because our strategy is, has become always on. I have two things just because they're fun um, that I'll just run through quickly. <laughs> that said that, uh, this is from the winter clearly, there was insight that said like inclement weather, people stay in and uh, we would see our acquisitions go up, right? So that's a data and a piece of data that we didn't have before where we'd really see people are subscribing and usage goes up. So we were playing with creative, um, you know, in, in this was actually on a mobile format that it was delivered, um, but it looks prettier on the big screen here. Um, this is just another one just because it's fun. The, we've been playing with all of these. Is, is social is a sort of key driver for us, right? Um, how can we enter in the zeitgeist? It's still, you know, this is one of the more fun kind of DR ads that we have. Um, I'll just go through this. The long night is coming, and the 
dead. Come with it. You get the idea. Different messages at different times, right? Really all just saying we have this kind of always on machine and now we have to create content at all of these different times for all of these viewers who are essentially could be at any stage of their life cycle um, with our programming. And when you think about Game of Thrones, you know, we, we did a program um, leading up to the premiere on platforms, which is a huge catch up strategy. This is just one piece of it. But we had some data that said on our streaming platforms that we knew that there was still 40% of the audience who hadn't watched Game of Thrones at all, which you know was a was a pretty big um, eye opener for us, and getting that audience to start at the beginning, right, and to try and make a binge like that manageable, you know, five seasons, 50 episodes, you know, you have to do it before the new season premiere. Um, those have been all core, and then I'll, I have one more, which I think is just I'm going to slip through quickly if it does it. Um, it's just the other real key difference for us is testing and optimization. You know, when you have a traditional 12 week, week flight when you're leading up to a premiere, you don't do this. I mean, we didn't, maybe, maybe you guys did, right? Testing copy, testing images, kept testing call to actions, doing the matrices, you know, like this whole testing practice, and this is just one example, right? You know, it was a huge, huge shift for us and being able to kind of do this, do it at scale um, and see and really understand how you test into new strategies. This was this kind of discipline, which, you know, if there's any DR marketers or anyone who has a DR background, you're like, duh. Um, this was all new for us. And this was something that our both, you know, everyone from everyone from, by the way, agencies on both media and creative, you know, internal, and then how we explain this to management and how this is our strategy. And it's not always the big cool. TV spot um, was a super um, important kind of learning for us. Those are some awesome creative. I'm curious, because uh, this comes up a lot when I, when I talk to publishers, how long did it take you to kind of identify some of those triggers of what actually is going to bring a valuable subscriber, not just a download, but what's actually going to give you somebody who's going to stick? Um, so uh, yeah, on the retention side, we started uh, to see data um, I would say like three or four months in, right? You start to see some signals um, about what is making people convert from the free trial to the pay. Um, and then you start to see some signals about, well, what are the triggers that are getting people to turn off? You kind of see the, the bad stuff first. But I think for us, particularly given the um, programming life cycle and how much that can affect all of those things, mm -hmm. it really, it's really a year's worth of data before we started to feel fairly confident about we know not only what are the kind of, um, what are the things that are driving attrition, but also what are the positive behaviors that we think we can actually affect that would have a, a, a kind of positive impact on retention. And again, that's sort of an ongoing thing that we're testing. And, and I'm guessing that that then caused you to pull levers on both creative and audience targeting, 100%. timing, the whole thing. Yep, right, right. So is there any data and insights that you don't have that you wish you did or you feel like help keeps you from going where you want to go right now? I think ask me that in a year. I think right now we're just trying to deal with the amount of data that we have. Like there, there's so much data available. The challenge for us is actually like making sense of that data, you know, cleaning that data, organizing that data, and then figuring out which data is actionable, um, and then how to action it. I think that was another kind of key learning for us is that you can have all the data in the world, but if you don't have the infrastructure, people, process technology to do something with that data, um, it's not very useful to you. Okay. Well, I know we're going to take a Q&A, but before we do, will you entertain me with a lightning round? Maybe. Okay. I promise to behave. Okay. Right. Here we go. Everybody ready? Here we go. You cannot have both. You have to pick one. Is okay. it this or that? Okay. <laughs> Dominate or differentiate? Differentiate. Warriors or Cavs? Warriors or what? Cavs. Do you know ba basketball? No. no. She's <laughs> a dancer. <laughs> Clearly not. Warriors, whatever. <laughs> Art or science? Art. Pied Piper or Huli? Is it Huli? Uh, uh, Pied Piper. Okay. Logic or intuition? Intuition. Bond or born? Both are hot. Bond. OK. <laughs> All right. Engaging or efficient? Efficient. Cerce or Dinars Dinar Dinaris? Daenerys. I always say that wrong. Oh, yeah. I always say it wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Which one? Daenerys, for sure. OK, fair enough. Retention or acquisition? 
retention. Snapchat or Instagram? Snapchat. <gasps> <laughs> oh. Sorry. We'll talk later. <laughs> you put the question in. I didn't put the question in there. I invited it. I didn't put Facebook on purpose, but no. Okay, so I think we we're going to I'm not cool up. enough for Instagram. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I'm still figuring out stuff. All good. So we're going to go ahead and take questions, I think. Yeah, all right. Who's the brave soul that wants to go first? There's no They're hungry. Questions. They're totally nobody, hungry. Nobody, everyone wants to go. Uh oh, on. we got somebody up here. Okay. I don't need the mic. Um, oh, okay. So, with this free one month push that you did, what kind of, uh, kind of reaction did you get? Did you get a bump to subscribers? How did it work out? We've had a free, a free month since we launched. We went for one short period, we went down to a free week instead of a free month. Um, but I think that, that trial period, A, is kind of standard, so Netflix kind of um, sets the standard there. Um, but it's, I think from my perspective in marketing, and I think there will be other perspectives from other people in the company, it's an, it's an imperative for us because we need to get people to try the product and you need to get people to use the product. Um, and 30 days is like just enough time to try and really influence behaviors that we know will have a positive effect on conversion and retention. But did you get a bump in subscribers for HBO? Was there a, a noticeable action, call to action from this to, uh, more, more so, so the one month is 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 for our streaming platform only, and and yes, I think we feel successful with the numbers that we've gotten on HBO now to date, right? And and that has been additive to the kind of core linear business. Okay. Sure. Can you talk? Does this work? Yeah. Could you talk more about your relations with the device partners, all of the OTT partners, and when do you broach in kind versus um, paid support with them? And, and are you always agnostic, or do you ever test uh, specific strategies with one over the other? Sure. Um, so, so I should start by saying that the, the kind of partner marketing relationships or that the distribution relationships is not totally my purview, right? So, um, but uh, what I'd say is we look at them in total. So we, and kind of um, that they work together. So we know that editorial placements in the app stores, for instance, is, has a huge impact for us. What we found is, as you can imagine, um, they all kind of want the same thing, like they all want you know, extra content from Game of Thrones or whatever that might be. So, so from a like in kind, um, that's really been in the same way that it would be with anything. It's kind of managing these editorial relationships and figuring out, you know, who is going to give the, the biggest bang for the buck. Um, the on the flip side. Uh, we, some of the relationships have come with uh, marketing dollars attached to them, and so we do do, um, you know, more paid type style things on like Roku, for instance, and we know that that, you know, if you can, if you can market to somebody who's already on the product, particularly in, a, in an environment like a connected TV, um, it, you're going to have pretty significant impact. So we've kind of looked at combinations of, of all of the above. Um, yeah. You're welcome. Sure. You uh, spoke a bit to the expectation that maybe you're not gonna get the data you want until after a year of accumulating it, looking at it across behaviors and churn. I wondered if you could identify maybe a couple of specifics as far as what you've seen that subverts churn and or indicators that you say, oh, three days, they haven't done anything. Five days is the sure. killer. That kind of thing. Sure, I think the the biggest one for us, which is probably not surprising, it, it, like a, a lot of this stuff, you go, yeah, that makes total common sense. Um, bigger screen. So even though something like now, right, you think about about it as a as a mobile product, and a lot of the acquisition efforts are done on a mobile device, right, because that's where the kind of advertising ecosystem is. We know if we get you to a connected TV, if you're watching on Apple TV, on Roku, on whatever it is, you're much stickier, and that, that might be our content. But it sort of goes to show that even though mobile is king, TV is not dead. Um, it's just the way that you deliver it. And so, so that's key. And then, of course, um, 
it, frequency of usage and also v variety of types of program. That was another sort of key for us, right? So, um, and, and it makes sense. It, it all comes down to the value, right? So do you value the subscription enough for it to be worth what you're paying for every month? And you know, the more you use or the more members of your family use or the more you use it for various types of cons consumption, um, the better, the more value the, the product is gonna give you and so you're more likely to stay. Yeah, and just to add to that real quick, because uh, whether I'm working with publishers or music streamers or, or partners like Sabrina, that is a key indicator, is frequency and time spent, right? So they know if they can get them to watch X number of shows or kind of binge watch a certain series, that that's like gonna just dramatically increase their likelihood to stay and so that helps us build marketing strategies that get people to continue to come back and to understand that there's more for them so that you can get them to that point quicker and then ultimately they'll stay with you longer because they understand once again what you're worth and willing to pay for it when they have to go pay that bill each month. Um, Microphone. Did you deal with having two different core audiences? Because you have the one which is an older audience like yeah. linear versus a younger one using the mobile applications. How did you deal with that internally in terms of, all right, we're gonna build campaigns for these guys, but you know, the one that our core audience, it's 20 years older, or 30 years older. Yeah. How did you deal with that dynamic? I think the thing that was most surprising, and I think the hardest for people to understand, I sort of made a joke about it earlier, but it's been really key for us is, um, there's an entire generation of consumers now um, who, don't really have the same kind of brand familiarity with HBO. So they may have heard of The Sopranos or they may have heard of The Wire, but they don't necessarily relate it to HBO. Um, and they don't have that same kind of relationship, right? They're sort of, their, their relationship is with TV programs. Um, and that was like a, that was a big eye opener, particularly for management, right? Who's used to like our pedigree and the fact that we're award winning and all that stuff. So what, what we found, particularly on the streaming side, is we had to do a lot of education um, about the brand and about the value of the brand and how we are a differentiator. Um, and, and also like the history of our content, which was totally new for us. Um, and one way that that has come to life that, that has been kind of fun is we just did, um, or in the middle of doing a six feet under 15 year anniversary campaign, which I don't think anyone would have really, I, I think we would have had a hard time selling in the need to, to do that um, a few years ago, but in a world where we know that, that like you can binge this entire season, it's there for you. And by the way, if you start to dig in, it is one of the best series, like critically, right, acclaimed series that has ever been written for television. And so we've, we had to find new ways to package that to an audience and start to like, to, to try and make that binge manageable and, and, to, and to say like there is all of this library content on the HBO apps that is very valuable and it still stands up today. Yeah. Sorry, Sophie. You're not <laughs> there. She has to run. When you decided to launch HBO Now, did you face any kind of resistance from the cable operators? <laughs> no comment. I'll take that question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I um, that's probably best uh, answered by somebody who isn't me in the organization, to be perfectly honest. Um, what I can tell you uh, more explicitly about the marketing is that we've, we've, the language that we've used to describe that has changed over time um, as, you know, as our distributors have gotten used to this. Um, so for instance, you see in almost everything we do, no TV package required. Um, that language we did not use at launch. Yeah. <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> How spiky are HBO subscriptions? Like for example, Game of Thrones comes on in April and I think people subscribe for it. And then how do you market to avoid the spike? Like would Six Feet Under be a strategy to say, hey, you're here, why don't you stick around? Yeah, I think, I think look, Game of Thrones, um, first of all, like I'm so obsessed. Um, <laughs> um, I'm like I've hit that like weird super fan yeah. status this season. <laughs> um, 
but it is a phenomenon of itself, and, and I think we've always seen that that, that is going to have a kind of outsized impact on, on everything. So, you know, I've been running the digital platforms for a long time, and you'd always see, we'd always know that big programs drive big spikes in traffic and engagement and all of that, and the same is true on the streaming platforms, and so it is really our job to get you into other things. Like, you will be stickier if, and this goes for it's a strategy that goes across, but you will be stickier if you watch more than Game of Thrones. So yes, Six Feet Under is one of those. You know, we have the Night Of coming up, which we're really excited about. So we're, we, we talk a, a lot about handoff strategies and trying to get people into other, other content. Um, and the more we can do that, the, the kind of better. And as well as catch up, right? So trying to get people to kind of engage with the series prior so they come in a little bit earlier. OK. So we have time for maybe one or two more questions, if anyone's got them. No? Okay. <laughs> How many pieces of creative are you testing at one time? Oh my god. So you have an fucking answer? many. <laughs> 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 Which was like a huge shift for us, you yeah. know? You're just totally thinking about how you do that differently. And it's not just you know, if you think of pieces of creative, but it's the images, the call to actions, the copy, you know, video, do you test into video versus static? Do you do Canvas? Like, that, and that's just on Facebook alone, and then multiply that by all the partners we use. It's, um, yeah, that, the, the, like, managing through a test matrix has been a, a big, a big learning. And I'm guessing that's where you really did need a, part, a third party to come in. Yes. Oh yeah, and you need an agency who um, can report on that and make sense of that and give you real insights and optimize based on that. It's, it's, a, it's a totally different way of thinking than the traditional tune-in way. Yep. Last question. How long will you test and when do you know when the product is ready to go live? How long do we test the ad creative or? So, um, so we, we're testing in a live environment almost always. So the, all the ads you saw, all the different combinations, um, were all live at some point. And what we tend to do is test against our control. So there, there's a few different ways, but we can test against the control, and then when you beat out of control, you you move that that creative in. Or sometimes we've had multiple things kind of live at the same time, and Facebook's say it's turning into a Facebook sales pitch. I didn't. It's not. <laughs> Um, but you know, the services like Facebook will auto optimize to the best performer for you. So there's sort of different ways to do it. I think one of the things are when you have an ongoing, especially an app install strategy. What we've learned quickly is that uh, creative wear out is also a fa factor. Um, so so not only are you testing, you have to test fast enough that you can get ahead of a wear out. So we tend to see that creative can wear out um, as quickly as two weeks. So so that just like ups the amount of creative that we're that we have in development at any one time, and then where we ultimately want to go is where where we're also, especially on the retention side, where we're understanding your usage patterns and we're delivering a much more one-to-one -one kind of creative to you. Right now, we're doing kind of we're still doing segment-based instead of you know true true kind of one-to-one -one messaging. Awesome. Well, Sabrina, thank you. Thank and you. And everybody, thank you for coming. Thanks so much.